Hey, how are you doing? I'm good, thanks. Yeah, Sunday, not a bad day. It's a bit overcast, but good. How about your end? Yes, it was uh, nice and sunny earlier on. It's got overcast again, so, you know, usual English, English weather. But there you go. What can you do? Before I forget, um, at some point, we need to make a note. There's a million and one topics we could discuss. But certainly, the, some of the issues you've been reading about in the States and handcuffing young children. Mm. <laughs> yeah, <I've seen> that. <laughs> I think that's one we need to definitely put on the agenda. Well, let's kick off with that one, mate. Take it away. Uh, well, um, and in fairness, we've only got the video clips and some headline news. But um, I think the issues of, you know, uh, handcuffing of, uh, I think there were two cases. One was a six-year-old child and the other one uh, was certainly younger than 11 years of age. And again, I'm going to call it disruptive behavior in the classroom. Yeah. And from the newsreel that was delivered and the information that was printed, I find it very, very difficult to conceive how these children's behavior was so significant that it warranted being handcuffing. Because mm. we come back to the issues, don't we? As we I think we touched on the last time, and certainly the, you know, the broader issues around, I'm going to say, use of force, i.e., unless somebody's doing it for a greater good, or prevent further harm in terms of the injury occurrence that may occur to themselves and or others. Yeah. Then, you know, the reason for either hands-on in terms of physical intervention or handcuffing, then with a six-year-old child, I, I'm trying my best, but I'm really, really struggling to see how, you know, on both cases, it warranted handcuffing of the child. Yeah, I haven't read, read them um, fully, so I'm not, not aware of all the ins and outs of it. But again, coming back to the age of the child, you know, you, we're talking about, a really small kid here <laughs> and you know it also if you, if you just get into the sort of practical applications of it mm -hmm. you know, the size of the bracelets you'd have to have on the handcuffs you know to yes. fit on a child that small is crazy because they're bound to slip out of them if, they, if they're putting standard handcuffs on them you know so it's absolutely madness you know i mean i was doing some work with um a, a prison service unit i, I won't say where uh, but they got the highest levels of escape in from handcuffs in europe right and uh, when we got down to it, we said, well, how are they slipping out? And they said, well, they haven't got the right inserts. Can you give us some training? And we said, yeah, we can give it some training, but it might be just a, sort of a good thing to get to the right size inserts. You know, you say, save you a lot of hassle. And going back to this point you're making with the children, uh, you know, do they make handcuffs that small? I, I don't know. No, well, I think you make, I mean, you make a very interesting point and a very valid one. Uh, like you, I'm not aware, I have to be honest, but B, I, and, you know, and this assumption, and you and I don't like to work on assumptions, but I think it's, in context, it's fairly reasonable. The child's probably so traumatized anyway, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah bless you, know, the poor child. And certainly in one of the cases, they put the child into the back of a police car, you know, to further compound, compound matters. I, I, well, it goes uh, back to that case we had here in the UK, I don't know if you recall it, where there was, I think it was an autistic child was in a swimming pool and the lifeguards wanted him out well done. and, and he, he wouldn't get out because he, he, was, he, you know, he couldn't communicate he was in a, in, a, in a bit of a trauma so six police officers turned up i think it was six anyway and they, they jumped in the pool and basically dragged him out of the pool and every time that kid hears a police car now he hides under the bed now you know i'm saying now at the time you know it was reported mm. that he was hiding under the bed so god knows what's what's going on there it's absolutely madness yeah, I think again, and we know, um, forgive me, I can't remember the exact title of the document, which is slightly unfortunate at the moment, but you know, the Memorandum of Understanding, which was published between uh, the police, the psychiatric profession, the mental health services, and one other, which uh, slips my memory at the moment. But the issue is about, isn't it, i.e. people in mental health care, you know, i.e. There, there is now the redirection that they have to be managed internally under their own auspices to begin mm. with. Yeah. And, you know, for me, if, if there is a need to call the police because the behavior has become quite excessive around challenging and aggressive, then that acknowledgement that the police work into a slightly different set of protocols in the mental health services. Yeah, and, and they're going to manage that by making the police wear body cams, aren't they? Indeed, yes, that's yeah, right. That's, that's how they're trying to manage it in, in this <laughs> new, new mental health unit's use of foresight, you know, but wear body cams. They're, but they're, they're, tra they're trained to a completely different criteria. Absolutely. But uh, yeah, it's just, I mean, and as I say, I mean, certainly I think it's worth us, I'm going to say some of the specific cases, they are America, but you know, I'm sure we can just do a bit of reading because it doesn't change what part of the world it is, that we can just have a look at and give our views and comments around it in a bit more detail because at the minute we're making, we're generalizing, but I think what we're both saying from a general perspective is fairly, you know, it's fairly reasonable within itself. 
Well, it, it also goes back to um, a, a link that a guy called Ricky Holder sent me, which I sent you a link to, which is the non-delegable duty of care and the vicarious liability. You know, yes. because if you hand over the, the, the authority, if you like, if you subcontract someone, and even if, you know, school brings in the police, yeah. now, I don't know what it's like in the States, they probably get sued more often than we do over here, you know, I, I don't know, but you're, you're handing over the duty of care to a third party agency. And if they're on your property, if they're on your premises, you know, there, there's a line of causation back there. And, you know, and I had an interesting phone call uh, this week, actually, from mm. someone, and they said, we've got a problem, and they don't mind me talking about it, because I've asked them if I can talk about it, I just won't mention any names. Uh-huh. And they said, we've got a patient that, that uh, they have care homes, so service using more than patients, sorry. Uh, and it's, they're not secure care homes, so the patients can come and go as they see fit and go down the shops and do whatever. Mm-hmm. And one patient has now to, started to exhibit behavior where they're leaving the care home and going to a bridge and attempting to jump off to commit suicide. And they contacted me and I said, well, what, what advice have you had? Have you had an MDT meeting? They said, yeah, the, the police have said we can't stop him leaving the care home. He's, got, he's allowed to go. And then once he's in the public domain, then they'll get involved. I said, all right, well, what happens between him leaving and the police arriving if he's on a bridge? And they said, well, we can follow him um, and we can feed back to the police and so on and so forth. Um, but we're, we're scared of grabbing hold of him because if he jumps with staff hanging onto him, staff could go over the bridge. So I said, all oh, right, well, you need to have some, you know, you need to have an MDT meeting around this. And, and the interesting thing was I said, what does the risk assessment say? Right. And yeah, you know the answer I got. Yeah, I can see you smiling. They went, well, you know, the, the social services are not willing to commit anything to paper. And I said, it doesn't matter what social services are willing or not willing to do. What does the risk assessment say? Because the risk assessment will give you your control measures. Absolutely. I said, have you got the health and safety person involved? They said, no. I said, get the health and safety person involved. Because there's a whole load of stuff going on here. Mm-hmm. I said, but fundamentally, you've got a duty of care to that patient whilst they're on your property. If they leave that property and you know that they're hardly probably they're going to go and jump off a bridge. I said, there's all sorts of issues here. I said, forget breach of health and safety. You've got breaches of human rights. You've got yep. potential corporate manslaughter issues coming your way. I said, and I'm not necessarily sure that the police's advice is correct. I said, so you might want to check that. I said, because mm. if that's what they're telling you. You want to set up a liaison protocol and get the police involved. So he, this guy was really nice. He said, I've got to go back to some more meetings and this and the other. I said, well, can we ask the first question? And he said, what's that? It, is the service user in the right location, in the right environment? Yes. And it, it, he said, well, it's a question I'm going to ask. I said, well, yeah. I said, you should, because, you know, if he's exhibiting his behavior, anything you do from now on is considered a planned intervention. Yes. I said, if you choose not to intervene, then you're planning not to do something when you know there's a risk. I said, there's a whole load of stuff's gonna fall out from this. <laughs> and he got back in touch with me and he said, yeah, we're, we've, and there was all issues to do with the local authority funding, I think, could put him in a secure home and cost more money. And I said, well, that's what the risk assessment will tell you, the risk we cost thing. So he came back and he said, yeah, we're, we're, getting, we're getting in place somewhere else. But it, it, it just, you know, I hear this all the time, and you've probably done the same, where people are trying to come up with sticky plaster, you know, solutions without looking at the whole aspect of risk. And it's, it's absolutely mad. But it, but it is interesting, you know, and you, and you kind of, you quite rightly alluded to the issues about, you know, I'm going to say the question of negligence. Yeah. You know, and the, the issue about, isn't it, you know, but the duty care, the breach of the duty care, I'm thinking the causation, I'll keep it succinct because most people, you know, know the threads, but, you know, the duty that's sold by default is a patient there. And as you quite rightly point out in the first instance, well, is it the right place for him? But I think fast forwarding as well, the point that their dynamic risk assessment is, you know, if we confront him at the bridge, then we might all be pulled down with him and that huge gap in between, isn't it? As you say, well, hang on, let's look at the breaches about your standards in the first instance. Yeah. And this and is the thing about dynamic risk assessment. This gets thrown about a lot these days. If yeah. people start me to make a dynamic risk assessment. And it seems to be happening in, in lieu of the fact that they're not doing a proper risk assessment and leaving it up to staff. So Absolutely. the staff were meant to do a dynamic risk assessment. And I remember talking to um, an agency a while ago and I said, well, what training did they get in doing dynamic risk assessments? They said, well, they, they, they just have to sort of think on their feet. I said, right, so it's not a dynamic risk assessment. And I said, basically, you, you're allowing them the discretion to make a decision. He went, yeah, I said, well, that decision's the wrong one. And they went, well, you know, then we'd have to deal with that. And I went, yeah, I said, potentially you'd have to deal with it. I said, but also it puts you as the employer mm-hmm. in the frame because of the vicarious liability that's attached to the fact that you were allowing a member of staff without any training in risk management to make a decision based on these throwaway words, dynamic risk assessment. I said, and this non-delegable duty of care company, you can't delegate the duty of care to the employee, particularly if they have no training. 
And uh, you know, there's a lot of agencies that are not aware of this stuff. No, and I think, and again, you know, I think that point you mentioned about, for example, the focus group meeting regarding let's identify the risk and link to the MDT teams, et cetera, mm. themselves. You know, and, I, and I'm going to reference it briefly because we're both, you know, we're both quite rightly you know, mentioning the point and alluding to it. But, you know, the first instance around hierarchy of risk control, isn't it? You know, eliminate the risk. Well, you know? yeah, it would make sense. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, sorry, we're both smiling. <laughs> we're doing it again, aren't we? Yeah. But with respect, you know, whilst it's a strategic aspiration, it is also still a task function reality, isn't it? Is that balance between the two? Aye, all the time, you know, from a, you know, from the strategic point of view, all the time the patient's still there, in the short term, he or she may repeat the same behaviour. Yeah. yeah. But having said that, from a task function point of view, going back to you, exactly your point on the bridge, what measures are we putting in place before they actually get to the bridge? Well, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I, I draw the analogy of it being akin to turning up on a building site one day. So, you, you, you know, you're a labourer or you're a bricklayer or something, you turn up on a building site, there's a big sign that says hard hats must be worn at all times. And you turn up and you say to the foreman, I forgot my hard hat today. I oh, don't no, no worry, mate. We'll send you on a brick dodging course in case someone drops a brick <laughs> off the top of the building. Yeah, it's, it's laughable. But this is what's happening. They're saying to people, well, go and do the risk assessment. I've had no training. Well, you know, figure it out. It's absolutely crazy. Let's wait till they get to the bridge and then decide. No, absolutely, absolutely perverse. But it's interesting because if we take the jokes aside one minute, I mean, look at the fact of, of agencies, and you and I have been in this industry a long time. Mm -hmm. Agencies that just say, right, we need some restraint training or breakaway training or whatever, right? And they go, can you provide it? Yeah, okay. Great, okay, how much? They give me yeah. a price, yeah, I don't want to get cheaper than that. Okay, and it all comes down to price. Mm -hmm. What they don't realize is, is that if they, whoever they bring in to do that training, they're fundamentally liable for. Now, I, I had a case years back, years and years ago in Weymouth, where a woman turned up on a course and she was wearing heels, shoes with heels on, just like you do, Trevor. They're high heel shoes, right? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the on the street only goes to about my chest, doesn't it? Back to the program, please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the trainer said to her, apparently, they're not appropriate for, for physical skills. And she said, well, this is what I work in, and I've got a work dress like this, and if you can't train me, you know, and this is what I wear to work, then you're useless. And the trainer buckled. So he trained her. And you know when things go wrong, mate, it, it doesn't go wrong oh, once, it's one yeah. after the other. She stumbled backwards somehow. She was pushed, if I remember correctly, and she hit the wall and slid down, and the spigot of the radiator damaged her coccyx. So she sued, and the local authority said, oh, you have to sue the training provider. And the solicitor said, no, 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 we're oh, suing you because yes. you brought that training provider in and didn't do your due diligence. And they settled out of court, and it was tens of thousands of pounds. You know, and this, this, I mean, you must have been involved in similar cases like this. No, well, absolutely. And I think, you know, we, even working right back to the fact of in the first, isn't it, you know, you and I have heard the term a million and one times reality based training. Yeah, and whilst we all get reality based training, you know, I think sometimes people forget training needs to be safe first and effective. Oh, mate, yeah. Training. Yeah, so don't be wrong. We, you know, we, we both acknowledge some training needs to be very dynamic in context. We get that, but it still needs to be safe first. Well, yeah, but I think that's dynamic to, to the level. Of, of what you can expect staff to deal with after the end of a two, three, or five day course. Absolutely. You're not going to make someone ex give them 20 years of experience in, in doing self defense or restraint in, in five days or three weeks, even. So no. you've got to train the level of experience, you've got to train to the, their ability and their capability. And oh, there's people out there that they're, they're crazy, absolutely yeah, well, crazy. Well, even linking to that as well, though, you know, as you say, and which past what you're saying, the fact of, you know, excuse the cliche, but the likelihood of occurrence. Mm. You know, because I mean, and again, you know, I'll just throw it out there as a heading, but I'll come back on point, a tiered approach to training, you know, rather than one size fits all, which is an issue we have, but around abstraction time, sorry, I'm throwing so many headings out there, but bringing it back to the point at hand on the matter at hand, you're absolutely right. Yeah, I've had people turn up for training, having read the joining instructions, well, allegedly read the joining instructions, and as you say, they come in the Sunday best, you know, with either high heel shoes on or some kind of brogue footwear with leather sole shoes. And then we've had an issue and debate where, you know, to put, it, to, to put it as politely as possible, you know, we've had an issue about them taking part in all of the training, which they're not happy about. But it's like, well, the, clear, the joining instructions clearly stated to the effect of casual, loose-fitting clothing with appropriate footwear. Yeah. You know, if you, uh, I don't know, Oxford brogues. <laughs> you, you must get this as well, where they say, well, this is what I wear at work. 
Uh, oh, right. But we're trying to run a safe training course. And, yeah. and my, always, my stock answer to that is, is, look, whatever you wear at work is between you and your management team. And if they expect you to restrain people or get involved with physical activity wearing those shoes, that's a liability your management team have to deal with. But while you're on this course, you wear the appropriate clothing. And I've put people off courses when I have the appropriate clothing before. Oh, I've, um, I think off the top of my head, probably two, maybe three times, I've kind of, I can clear, well, fairly clear to remember, yes, as you say, people coming along inappropriately dressed. Mm. And, yeah, and I use the heading inappropriately dressed, i.e. what they would wear nine to five day to day, not in terms of training, particularly around practical skills application. Yeah, yeah uh, and I've had that yeah, going back a number of times. I think as well, though, I just want to link back, as you say, about the, you know, the, um, the, care, the dental case issue we were reading about as well, the non-delegable duty. Yeah. yeah. And I think, as you say, going back to training in particular, well, you know, the amount of times, isn't it, that people subcontact to other trainers, you know, and if I can make the analogy around, I'm going to call it basic and advanced training, just for ease of discussion, you know, basic training, non-restrictive, restrictive interventions, if I just use that as a heading. And then something that's, you know, advanced training based around the need, you know, because obviously, as we know, it needs to be a training needs analysis, uh, an operational need as well. But the fact is, you say, people come in and, you know, and I've, you know, I've seen it, and I've got to be honest, I'll be, you know, I'm just going to put it out there, be transparent. I've seen it from both perspectives, you know, let, you know, we're looking for a trainer to do X, Y, and Z. You know, we get a response back. Uh, let's just say, well, you know, Travel knows them, Mark Dawes knows them, or they know Travel, they know Mark Dawes. Well, they must be a good person. Let's book them in for the training, send them along to X, deliver a course of training. You know, and all the time, nothing appears to go wrong, and everybody seems fine with it. But we're right back to, isn't it, this non delegable duty of care. <laughs> you know, at the end of the day, if they book the course through Travel and or Mark Dawes, then ultimately Travel and or Mark Dawes is ultimately responsible for the end product of that service delivery. Hmm. Well, that's why, I like, like you, uh, you know, I have checklist. Oh, my thing's going to ping in there. You're me, is that you? No, it's probably me. Uh, right. you know, I, I've got checklists that, that cover everything. You know, in fact, my trainers take the mickey out of me because, you know, every time something, you're, like, you're going to produce another checklist. Damn right, I'm going to produce a checklist. <laughs> you know, because they, they have to follow a system and there's yeah. a rope on that system. And, you know, everything's in there, even descriptions of what they should teach. There's manuals, there's videos. There's no way they can step off the plot with it, you know, and then if they choose to wander off the plot, you know, they, they should be self-regulating between the other trainers. One trainer will pick the other trainer up uh, yeah. and then, then it will come back to me and I'll deal with it. But I, I've, had, I've had cases in the past where I've, I've given people stuff to do. I've, you know, jobs come in, I've said, well, I'm looking for a trainer. Someone said, yeah, I can do that. And they're, they're good guys. You know, I've seen them before. I've known them for a few years and they're brilliant. I say, right, teach this, follow the system, do whatever. Take a few videos of the techniques because I want to audit it. And they send the video yeah. in and go, where did that come from? Right. You know, well, <laughs> we don't teach that. We've never taught that. We're, I don't know. You've got videos, manuals, checklists. Then you've got to go back and you've got to redo the whole thing again. You know, and I don't know what it is. I think it's it's maybe people just like to think they have the freedom to do what they want, but you know, when it's down to our liability, that's something they can't play with. But I think sometimes as well, though, isn't it? You know, and trying to be balanced here, it comes down to that fine line. You know, I'm going to call them the genuine what if questions. Let me start then, you can finish. But I'm going to say the genuine, define genuine, but bear with me, genuine for the sake of this discussion. You know, but if we have a, a, what we believe is a genuine what if question that needs to be addressed in the right way, then with the point I'm trying to get to, then if I, you know, I as a trainer need to make a record of what the genuine question was and how I addressed it and who I addressed it with. Yeah. The point I'm trying to get to, mm. yeah, because you're right. There comes a point, doesn't it? And I'll hand it back to you at the moment. How far do we go with the what if questions? <laughs> Over to you, please, mate, because I can see you're jumping to get in. But I'm just going to turn this this email thing off because it's doing my head at the moment. But I'll do the same, actually, cause it's, I'm sorry. it's down to the risk assessment. I keep coming back to this risk assessment point. Yeah. You know, uh, and I think we did this on the last video where, where someone asked me the question. They said, "What would you do if you were tied in the chair?" You know, you're in a chair and they strapped your legs up and, and your arms were secured to the chair with masking tape and you had masking tape over your mouth and, they, and someone was biting you and hitting you. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Not a lot. You know, what, what would you do? <laughs> oh, well, you know, have you got a technique for it? No. And you go back to the first aspect of, of risk assessment, you say, how likely is that going to occur? Well, yeah, well, it's, it's, it's hypothetical. I'm not going to deal with it. Yeah. You know, if it's not going to happen, I'm not going to deal with it. Yeah, but mm -hmm. it could happen. Show me the evidence. Show me the evidence that says that could happen. If you can show me the evidence, I'll deal with it. And they go, well, there's no evidence. I mean, and I had this recently with, with um, a trainer. He was a lovely guy. Mm. And he came over from another system. And I think he didn't want to leave the other system. So he was a little bit miffed. And he said, well, it, have you got any techniques for hair grabs? So he said, a load of techniques for hair grabs. He said, well, it's not on this, this 
this for this organization. I said, well, we've never had a need to do it. Yeah. He said, but I've got loads of staff that you grab by the hair. I said, really? He said, yeah. I said, well, give me the, give me the incident forms. I said, we'll have a look at it. I said, we'll come out, we'll do the risk assessment. I said, we'll have this sorted out in a couple of days for you, but I want the evidence. Mm -hmm. said, there isn't any evidence. He said, but I know it's happening. So I said, <laughs> I said well, <laughs> all right, um, I'll, I'll make the call. So I made a call to the directors and said, look, this is what this guy is telling me. And they went in there. Look, they said, no evidence of it whatsoever. Yeah. And what it turned out was, well, in my last job, we taught them this. Well, that's great. You know, but if you don't need it, you don't need to do it. And this goes back to the point you were making about you know, people just buying off the shelf training. Yeah. You know, the days of off the shelf training have gone. It's got to be fit for purpose. And companies can save a lot of money if they actually looked at what they needed, did a very simple risk analysis and training needs analysis, and go, right, okay, from the assessment, the training needs analysis, this is what they're likely to come across. That's what mm -hmm. we need to train to do. And build into that the underpinning knowledge so they can use their discretion. Yeah, and I think as well, you know, and the other part of it, and we, you know, we're also going to touch on it, but I'll introduce it now, but the vicarious liability within all of this. Mm, yeah. You know, <laughs> you're doing a lot of smiling today. Right. <laughs> oh, it's one of my favourite two words. I can, assure, I can assure people, I haven't got a list of things, triggers for Mark. <laughs> you, <laughs> you know, like, you know it's a t-shirt. Yeah, yeah, I'm quite impressed with that, actually. Sorry, should I... 43, 43 years to the day, today, I joined up. Really? Yeah, yeah, 43 years today. Oh, well, I didn't join on a Sunday, mind it. Was, I think it was a Monday or a Tuesday, I can't remember. Well, yeah, absolutely. 43 years today, 8th of March, 1977. Oh, well done, mate, seriously. Yeah, oh, good luck. You remember it well? Yeah, shitting myself. <laughs> <laughs> it's not quite the response I was looking for. Oh, mate, I was, I was 16 years old. In, in my own little world, I was, I, was, I was cocky. I was a bit of a, bit of a naughty boy when I was at school. I was mischief, mischievous, I suppose, more than I was. Hey, yeah. And we all, are, we're, all, we're, all big, we're all big in our own little bubble. And all of a sudden, this, this, this world where the you know, first thing I saw was a gunnery instructor. And I thought, oh, I don't like the look of his stick. I'm probably going to get that a few times. <laughs> you know, but, uh, yeah, it was great, mate. Absolutely great. It taught me a lot. Yeah, I'm I'm sure for you. I uh, loved it with a passion. I can remember getting off the train at Asheville just so I heard of all the shots. Uh, actually, uh, uh, people may recall I was Royal Army Medical Corps who I joined back on that uh, beautiful day. Say again, sorry? Scablifter. Hey, 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 hey. Come on, come on. <laughs> hey, mate, Bunny put that on the thing. He said, he said, yeah, he did, didn't he? He <laughs> <laughs> did, actually. Yeah, well done. <laughs> yeah, well done. Fair point, he did. But uh, I can remember being on the train at Asheville Station and everybody else was going to all the shop. Most people joined the parachute regiment when they were based in all the shop, you know, going back. And then somebody pointed out to me, another lad called Trevor, squeakly enough, uh, isn't this your station, guys? Which we probably jumped off, got up at Ashvale, those of you who know it's a small little, well, it was a small little village, and then proceeded to walk about a mile up to the camp as you did back in those days with yeah. your little, kind of your bags and your rucksacks, kind of feeling sorry for yourself at 15 years old. We were senior service, mate. They took us in on the bus. Did they? Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. That's where you guys get spoiled, you see. You know, the part of the test for us was the character building, walking all the way to the camp and getting to the right camp. Yeah, we had no money. It's the only reason you walked. <laughs> there was that, mate. And the first thing was a haircut. But anyway, we could talk about that all day long, even though we had no hair. Anyway, you know, back to my care of liability. Absolutely. We, 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 but, I mean, but, but your point quite rightly, isn't it? Because we get these things cut up and, you know, we go back, don't we? You know, the learning outcomes, the aims, calling what you want of the program, isn't it? But we set the scene for the day, yeah? You know, LinkedIn, isn't it? We've had a discussion. I'm going to call it with the senior leadership team of a particular organization. And as we go for the learning outcomes, quite rightly, we encourage questions from the group. And I think, you know, going back to the point you made before, then we get this, yeah, but this is my reality in the workplace. You know, and then there's that over, isn't it, professional challenge. Well, hang on a minute. You know, whose responsibility is it in terms of safety in the workplace? You know, and depending on the group and the knowledge, et cetera, after that debate. So, you know, ultimately, well, you know, I'm responsible for my safety. Well, no, you're not really. It's your boss who's responsible for your safety, isn't it? In terms of the vicarious liability. Okay, fair enough. So when you're a competent worker, to use my quirky analogy, you know, I, as a workforce, as a, as a staff member, my apologies, as a staff member, you're 49% responsible for that you're a competent person. Your boss is 51% because we know, excuse me, responsibility, accountability is never 50-50. Mm. Yeah, somebody else, you know. So going back to your point, well, you know, our duty of care over their duty of care as staff is to manage upwards, isn't it? You know, and by submission of incident reports into risk assessments, going back to right back to the introduction of this talk, i.e., you know, the duty of care, i.e., for the senior leadership team to review the incident reports and the risk assessment process regarding then 
what are we going to put in place, aren't we, to enhance people's safety? So often, you know, when we get these what-if questions which go on and on and on, and I'm going to call them professional what-if questions, the point is, isn't it, i.e., if we're not meeting our duty of care, then with respect, managers can look people in the face and the point you just made a moment ago and say, what risk, what incident, what challenging behaviour, what disruptive behaviour, you know? We, you know, we've got to empower people more, haven't we, to submit incident reports. And I know I'm getting a little bit of salt box and I'll come off it in a moment. But the point is, isn't it, you know, if we're not telling people about the risks themselves, you know, and that emotional response, the anticipation of danger, you know, how are we going to empower each other to feel confident to manage these things, the probabilities before they go wrong? And mm. I'll get off my salt box now. But it's just a frustration, yeah. mate. It's a frustration, mate. Sorry. No, you're, you're absolutely right. You know, I mean, my last job in the, in, in the Navy was flying, which, which I think yep. that's the last video I failed in. Mm -hmm. I was just too, too keen to get down the pub. But, that's another story <laughs> as well. but the one thing about flying that was really good was it was very open when it came to reporting. That's why, you know, air traffic incidents are so low because there's, there's an openness and a transparency and people hold their hands up and go, look, I made this mistake and they learn from it. Whereas in our industry, you know, I think it was getting to a point where that was starting to happen, and, and it's, I, I'm seeing a you know a slight retreat from that now, where again it's going underground again. And you know, there, there's a fear out there that if people report stuff, they're going to be disciplined. You yes. know, I've, I've seen it on one one company's website where they they actually said, you know, if you have to resort to hands-on physical restraint or whatever, then right. you as a smart member have failed. You know, and that's, <laughs> that's a great thing to hit them on the head with. You know. Absolutely madness. Um, so th there's this underpinning issue that that, that should be it should be addressed, and staff should feel safe enough in the workplace to report because it's good data. It's fantastic data to have. Well, absolutely so. And I mean, I think again, we come back to this, isn't it? You know, if you know, at its lowest level, you know, I'm going to call it, you know, the anticipation of danger, which everybody at some point has felt. You know, but unless people are telling people how that other person's behaviors or making them feel at that time, yeah? How the hell are we going to enhance their safety and not the people around them? You know, and all right, you know, you go back to our younger days, we were joking about joining the Navy and the Army, et cetera. You know, and again, there were times, isn't it, at that low level, you tell somebody about something, they go, well, go away, young doors, go away, young Henry, get it sorted. You know, remember those conversations? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, let's be honest. The point was, if, that re if there was a reoccurrence of a similar incident, well, we weren't going back to that person because we knew we were getting no support. Well, I'll tell you a funny story, actually. When, when I was 16 years old, and I was just, just after I joined up, I was on my part two training. And mm. you remember, we always had to stay behind on leave because we were the new lads, but everyone else got leave. It was, yes. it was summer leave. And they, uh, another detail, it said, go to the chief petty officer's mess and paint the skirting boards. So I turned up bright and early, and there was this real old chief there smoking on a pipe, as you could in them days, big beard. He said, can I help you? I said, yeah, I've come to paint, I've come to paint the skirting board, Chief. He said, right, crack on with it. I said, where do I get the paint? He said, oh, come here a minute. And I went over there and he hit me in the chest and I went flying across the floor. He said, now think about it. Did I miss something? Did I not call him Chief or something? So I got up and I went, where do I get the paint from, please, Chief? He went, oh, but come here. He hit me again. He said, seriously, think about it. I mean, it didn't hurt. It was, yeah, it was more, more of a push to the head. Uh -huh. And I thought, you know, I got up. I said, should I go find out what the pain story is? He said, there's a good lad. I never asked him again. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I don't, you know, you'd never get away with stuff like that now. But, but it was a sort of a very sort of barbaric way of getting you to use your initiative, you know. And you know, so it comes back to the point is, what's the incentive for staff to use their initiative? And I'm not saying, you know, hit them and knock them across the floor. No, no. But if they're not getting patted on the back for at least using their initiative, they're going to yeah. default to the, you have to tell me everything and then I'll do it. Because at least if you tell me, I'm not liable. You know, it's that sort of mindset we're creating. But I think that links in, doesn't it? Was you know, it was many links, but two areas. One, as you say, post incident welfare support. You know, because we're very good, aren't we, with the service user, the customer, the patient, the resident, etc., etc., etc. But what we're not good with this stuff, isn't it? You know, back to that self help issue. Well, nothing really happened. It was a bit of a near miss. There were a little bit of language, a little bit of behaviour. But crack on with it, isn't it? And that's the point, isn't it? We've got to change culture. You know, and I know. You know, if you've been around for a long time, these things have been said before, but as we get new members of staff coming into the workforce, i.e. younger employees, then these messages need to be repeated, don't they? need to be kind of enforced, mm. you know, on a top-down perspective. But I, you know, I, know, I know I keep coming back to this dental case, but what I also found interesting in the dental case, because the claimant, as you know, the claims were against two people, weren't they? The contractor. And well, the subcontractor. Why don't you just explain the case so for people watching it if they haven't seen it? And I'll leave a link to it below. 
uh, what the case was about. Yeah, well, the case uh, involves, um, you know, uh, basically a lady who went for, who was referred from a, a dental practice in terms of a particular surgery. I'm going to call it for some minor surgery operation within themselves from there. Yeah, when they reported, yeah, when they reported, sorry, old school speak, when they went to that surgery, <laughs> report, I can't believe it's a report if it's using surgery. I know, I, don't, I can't believe it. <laughs> That's you talking about days gone by. Um, <laughs> but when, when they went to the dirigible surgery, then for part of the referral, then they were referred on in terms of minor operation, but from a special, for a special dental, my apologies, from a specialist dental surgery treatment. So again? You need some specialist dental surgery. Yeah, treatment. I know. But now I'm going to get my teeth back in. <laughs> anyway, they received the treatment. And forgive me, I'm going to just refer to something on here. Sorry, my apologies. Because just to make sure I get this bit right in itself. Yeah. And having received the treatment then in terms of when it was for a wisdom tooth extraction, you know, which took place. Uh, I can say it out loud, can I? Because you're going to post a link anyway, yeah? Yeah, yeah. It took place at the Flying Scotsman Centre within itself. Yeah, the claimant's case was that they failed to remove some of the roots from the teeth in itself and she was referred back yeah, for a follow-up surgery to be looked at where she was told that all the roots, excuse me, all the roots had come out and although subsequent x-rays showed that some had been left behind and required removal. Yeah, but due to a complaint and the fact that her dissatisfaction of the service and the subsequent removal took place at a different surgery. But importantly though, the claimant then Felt there'd been some, you know, she was left with some consequential sensory loss around her left dip, chin, and tongue, which is, you know, so she subsequently submitted a claim for, yeah. And the claim was we're going back to this non-delegable duty and the vicarious liability issues, which came to, which came to, you know, which came to part of this conclusion and report here, mm. and within itself from there. Now, interesting enough, you know, the claim was against the, the specialist dentist who carried out the minor operation. But that person didn't turn up at the county court for the hearing. That's right. So, under yeah. so understandably, the claim then was with, if you wish, the second claimant, which was the surgery she was referred to from the general practice. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm going to make that link back right back to them. The point is, isn't it? You know, when we or trainers bring, you know, when they subcontract work to training providers, then that issue isn't it about twofold. A you know, the non-delegable duty of care plus the vicarious liability duty of care. Mm. Yeah. And one of the interesting points in terms of the judge recommendations and findings here, and forgive me, around vicarious liability. Yeah. Yeah. And she quite clear, and it's quite clearly stated, isn't it? The means to compensate. Yeah. Oh, well, call me old fashioned. <laughs> Where does the bigger purse string lie? <laughs> yeah. Deepest pockets, isn't it? So let's just go for it. <laughs> Absolutely, you know, uh, you know, with, without a doubt in itself. But it was some of the factors which I found was quite interesting in itself. You know, was a lack of control, you know, from from the dental surgery itself into the minor minor surgery operator. Um, my apologies, the minor surgery operator, specialist operator. Mm. And particularly, what it doesn't state here, unless you've seen it, but I don't believe it states it here, was what was the terms and conditions of the contract. I haven't seen it. No, no I haven't seen it. But I mean. But it comes back to a point you made there, doesn't it? You know, when, when, when work is being contracted out to associate trainers or subcontractor trainers, what are the terms and conditions that we're expecting them to be working towards, isn't it, ultimately? Mm -hmm. And I have to say, you know, I, I do, you know, I appreciate people would be reading the report, but I, you know, I, I, not that it was, you know, our, let's just say our opinion, I couldn't find any kind of fault or criticism with anything I read within there. Right. You know, it's certainly, from my point of view, albeit you know the first claim, the first defendant didn't turn up at the hearing. But I have to, as I was reading through this, I did feel subsequently though that the second defendant, yeah, um, they owed the claimant a duty of care. You know, and this goes back. I mean, this goes. You can look at the list of the the Hall case that, that came out years ago, mm. where children were abused. You know, someone was, was employed by the local authority in a care home. Yeah, that person abused young kids. Years later, the young children, went, you know, when they grown up, went back and they, they took an action against the local authority. And the local authority said, "Well, we didn't know he was doing it," which you know, brick smacks of lack of supervision. But they they said, "No, we didn't know he was doing it, uh, and we're not liable for it." You know, he was in a position of trust. He'd passed the interview, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Uh, and they were you know they were found guilty um, on on that case because you know they were the employers. They had this non delegable duty of care and this vicarious liability. So it's, it's interesting because 
you know, I know that the police, I don't know if they're still doing it, but a while ago they had Article 13 of the European Convention on Human Rights emblazoned on their training materials, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yes, yeah, yeah. it's still, and, uh, I believe it's still there. I, I don't know if people are aware of this, but it makes you liable, not just for what you do, but for the advice you give. Yes. Um, and I had an interesting discussion, I think I put a video out about it a while ago, because if someone gives wrong advice, illegitimate advice or illegal advice, like, for example, I mean, the one thing bugs me is this thing called minimum force, it drives me nuts. Oh gosh, yes, you know, yes. You can only use force that's minimal. It doesn't exist, it's a social standard, not a legal one. Yes. But if people give advice like that, which is no basis in anything, and someone, it's very interesting, you say someone, you can only use minimum force, in that mm -hmm. member of staff's mind, they must be thinking, well, is that less than reasonable? So have I got to use a lesser amount of force than what the law says? Yep. If they get hurt, the person who gave that instruction is fundamentally liable. And they can compensate, they can go for compensation under Article 13, uh, the European Convention of Human Rights. And if he goes to, I mean, this was heard, this case was heard in the magistrate's court. So there's a benchmark there now. So if they take it to a magistrate's court, we've got a case law president on this one. Right. Uh, they'll, they'll get compensated for that. Um, and the, the real nail in the coffin is that the insurance will probably not cover them because they've given advice that they weren't qualified to give that was incorrect. You know, and, and people don't realize this stuff. but. You know, time and time again, I mean, one of the questions that came up, I put a thing up that we were doing this today, and someone said, uh, you know, if they, they were told when they got their black belt, then I was told this as well, funny enough, that you have to give three warnings. Oh, you. right. Yeah. <laughs> All right, yes. <laughs> I, I actually was quite scared about that when I started doing this work, and because um, I got everybody involved with the martial arts when I was younger, and I, and I got the black belts. And mm -hmm. then I was given this, you know, your license, and they went, well, you've got to register your hands as lethal weapons so I thought oh great you know and they said and you've got to give three warnings well where I lived if you if you'd given them one warning they'd have you you would never have got the chance to give them two more I thought I don't want to get involved in the fight I'm gonna lose and it was years later I found this old lawyer you know I was doing some work in the chambers in London and he said no 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 he said it all came from Simon Templer remember Simon Templer the same Roger yeah. I do remember that indeed. Well, on one of the programs, apparently, I mean, uh, he, 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 he said, uh, I have to warn, warn you three times I'm a judo black belt. And then if you don't desist, I'll give you a judo chop. It's not even a freaking chop in judo. You know? <laughs> um, but the whole martial arts fraternity went, oh, we better go and implement three warning, this free warning thing. Madness. You know? So that's, a, that's another one out there. Um, and here's another one for you. Um, right. and, and this Tracy put this on the comment box, actually. If I fight back, it will probably it will probably end up getting more injuries because it'll antagonize my attacker. Thank you, pardon? Yeah. I'll read it. 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 Where is it? Yeah. Don't fight back. It will aggravate your attacker. Okay. So yeah. I'm kind of. <laughs> I'll tell you where. Um, what was her name? Uh, there was a woman who did a lot of research into women who survived, you know, attempted rapes and everything in America. Oh, right. mm -hmm. It interviewed over a hundred, uh, a million women, and this advice was being given out by the Home Office at the time in the UK that you know don't fight back. Basically, you, you'll get more injured, lie back, and think of England sort of thing than put up with it. But there was no evidence to support the fact that that would work. In fact, you know, fighting back that you know gives gives you less injuries or you know as much injury as we could get if you didn't fight back. Yeah, and that was that was stuff when I was started teaching. When the Home Office were kicking out as part of their crime prevention thing. Gosh, but I, but I think you know, and it, it is interesting that point is you know don't fight back because it may occur more injury as well. What do you expect? You're already you past the point of no return, aren't oh, you? Totally mad. I mean, it, it, here's another one here. Hang on. Um, you're not allowed to put hands on or defend yourself against customers, even if they are about or are assaulting you, because you will get sacked. And that was a large transport company. Everybody I trained and told, told me this was the policy. So this guy's trained a large transport company. And they said they're not allowed to put their hands on and defend themselves against the customers, even they're about or are assaulting you because you get the sack. Okay, so let's look at the issues then about pre pre preemption. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, let's try and look, you know, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use the term common sense. You know, we could debate what we mean by common sense all day long, but common sense in the context of, and forgive me, I'm just going to quickly put it out there, but if you haven't had a chance to walk away, talk the situation down, if you know somebody's about to cause harm, it makes no sense, right, no reason, does it, to allow them to carry out that harm? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, really, at the end of the day, you know, so, you know, the controversial issue for some people around, yeah, all right, we don't want to go there, but, you know, if you know I'm about to hit you and you can't walk away and talk me down, etc., it makes no sense whatsoever, does it? At that basis, you've got two, op you know, two generic options. 
in no particular order. One is a flinch response when I go to hit you. Yeah. Or the other one, ideally, is you preemptively get me out of the way before I cause you serious harm. <laughs> you know, with respect. Yeah. That's, a, that's an employment tribunal you know, waiting to happen, isn't it? Oh, of course it is. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. What else we got? You got another one here. Jim's one, yeah. This one from a know-it-all a few weeks ago. <laughs> You're restraining an aggressive patient and they start to spit at you. And you, can, <laughs> and you can put a pillow over their face for as long as you think is necessary. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah. If they stop breathing now, I think I'm thinking it's safe. <laughs> I think it's uh, yeah. You might as well get a blank check out as well with that one, might you as well? Oh, really. Well, I mean, this, this is the thing. I mean, I put the thing out about spittles a while ago, and oh, that caused a good yes. trouble something to you. You know, they, they, they'll say, you can't use spit hoods, it's terrible, it's a demeaning, it's this, that, the other. But no, just suffocate them to death. You know, that, that'll, that'll do the job. You know? <laughs> <That's> a... <laughs> NHS staff told we're not, we are not allowed to defend ourselves. You know, there's another one that's coming. But, uh, <laughs> where, where does this information come from? Mate, you and I have been in there long enough to know where it comes from. It comes from <laughs> people who haven't, who haven't got the knowledge to know what they're talking about. It comes from managers who are probably worried about patients making a um, complaint and whatever, you know, saying it frankly. You know, I've had man managers give this, this advice out before. Yeah. But staff don't go to work to get battered. They should be entitled to go home in the same state they went to work in in the first place. And that's always been a driving thing with me. And I just get, you know, I see these comments and yeah, they're, they're laughable, but it, it's crazy, absolutely crazy. But I think the other one isn't it, and it didn't come out. And I mean, I appreciate you just read off a couple of comments there very quickly. Uh, but you said about minimum force, and the other one about last resort. Mm. Uh, but people's misinterpretation around last resort. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, we we're back to the analogy. You know, of course, of course, we all get. You know, in an ideal world, you know, you know we're going to try everything else first, and it fails. But with respect. You know, sometimes I use the analogy, people miss the blindingly obvious, because in hindsight to others, it appeared obvious, if you follow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I remember when, when, when Pete Boatman was alive, I, was, I went to a meeting with him, and they were on about it, oh, it, so. it has to be the last resort. And he said, no, 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 he said it could be the first resort. Exactly, you know, absolutely. If you have to do it, and it's necessary, it can be the first resort if it prevents the escalation. You know, you don't have to wait for the last resort. And that minimum force, I mean, it's been a bugbear of mine for years. Oh. You know, and I, I had someone on LinkedIn, um, I, I don't know, I think, I think you might know him actually. He was saying, oh, it's, it's, in, it's in the European Convention of Human Rights and it's in the human rights legislation that you can only use minimum force. I went, no, it's not. No, I actually said to him, I said, if you can show me the article, I said, I'll bear down to you superior knowledge. I said, but I've been lecturing on this for years and it's not in there. And what he came up with was he came up with the College of Policing's guidance and said, it's in there. So it must be law. Where did he, can you remember off the top yet? Because I don't ever recall reading that anywhere in there. Well, I mean, even if it wasn't there, it's guidance, it's not law. You know? Well, absolutely, absolutely. But it, but it, you know, people like this are in positions of influence and, you know, they, they go out, companies pay the money, they go out there and they, they advise these organisations who in turn advise their staff or they might even train their staff. And you're giving people the wrong advice, you know, and I, I think that it, it just opens up a huge liability for them. They don't, they don't know it. So, you know, the, and the company's vicariously liable for bringing the person in the first place. Right. You know. We're back to that point again, aren't we? Well, we even, I think we touched on it last time, didn't we? That controversial issue of, you know, I can only restrain people on the ground for three minutes, 10 minutes, etc. Remember these rules they used yeah, to have? Yeah. <laughs> you know, so at the end of three minutes and or 10 minutes, then you're supposed to step back, let them up and... What next? Well, let's be honest, let's restart the whole process again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And the thing is, you know, you can bring in all the, all the regulation you want, you can bring in all the legislation, you know, we, we, saw, we see this now regularly, you know, another act of violence come out or a new guidance has come out and it's well-meaning. But if mm. you don't get back to the fundamental issue, which is educating the staff that have to do the job, you can bring in whatever regulation and guidance and legislation you like, the staff are still not empowered to do the job because they're not being given the knowledge and the information and the instruction. And mm. um, that, in the main, comes down to probably budgetary issues in, in a lot of organisations where they say, well, you know, we don't want to put, I mean, I, I heard this on one course, I was, I was doing a course for an organisation and they came in, they said, when we go back, we've got to deliver some physical intervention and conflict management training. I said, okay, mm. great, too. we've been told we've got to do it in half a day for new starters. And that's just driven by financial issues, you know, and, and I think there was a staffing resource issue as well. Mm. So if you draw up the lesson plan, can you do it in half a day? I went, no. 
we can't do it in half a day because the new stars, they wouldn't be able to do this, we do that. Um, but it's the pressure coming down from the yep. top saying, that's all you've got, you know, make do with it. Well, I mean, but the issue, um, it's not a new pressure because the issues of abstractions, i.e., you know, the balance between training and duty in the workplace, mm. it's sort of, a, a, been a long standing issue. So, whilst I appreciate, you know, there are more pressures, you know, I'm going to say less staff, less resources, et cetera, themselves, but we can still come back, certainly from an induction perspective, yeah, then, mm. you know, to do all this in half a day, particularly if it involves physical intervention, is it's not it's it's just not going to meet the need it's not going to meet the need full stop yeah right. i'm sorry not, not for an induction program <laughs> it's just not it's not going to cut it you know you imagine, um, imagine when you join the army i mean how, how long was your basic training oh well for me i was i was a boy soldier wasn't i so you know you could argue the first three months you know the first term as we called it yeah yeah, uh, yeah it pretty much was i would say a good six weeks of the first term a good six weeks well, imagine if they said we got we're going to do some defence cuts now. Um, we're we're going to we're going to train you in, in six days. You know, to do yeah, something, it would take you six months or six weeks to do. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, if anything, and forgive me, I'm not up to date with the terminology, but they have these pre-selection centres, don't they, in the mm. services? You know, so you know, to support people, isn't it, towards a development to be able to do the basic training, you know, with a potentially higher success rate at the end of it. Mm. Yeah. So that, you know, that, that issue hasn't changed at all, has it? You know? But it, it's that, the last resort bit we were talking about before, you know, and, you know, as you say, sometimes your last resort is your first resort is your only option, providing let's get some evidence behind why, you know, they themselves. Because I think often, isn't it, that, you know, the gatekeepers, you know, and again, the gatekeepers sometimes just think about organisational reputation, aren't they? Mm. <laughs> let's be brutally honest. You know, it's not about the, you know, it's not about the staff so much. It's about, isn't it, the reputation of this organisation. I, we have no incidents, therefore there are no, there were no very few risks. You know, therefore we don't need. We we'll come back to we only need half a day's training. You know, those factors come into play. I mean, I certainly have a view, and I, I'd be interested in your view as well. You know, that generally, particularly where there's a need around, let's say, physical intervention, that a, a contextual element of common law duty of care should be threading into the program oh, without a doubt. you know to meet people's individuals perceptions or ask used upon the link to genuinely honestly held belief mm. you know, we come back to don't we you know the debate we all have from time to time you know um i it's about perception isn't it you know i perception on the basis of if we believe it it's real yeah but i mean right back, <laughs> go on. I agree. And this, but this goes back to another point and we'll have to end soon because otherwise people are going to get yeah. listening to us but um <laughs> They love this community. They bore this in you. Hey, hey, whoa! <laughs> whoa! I'm oh my God! You can't see. You can't see, but my legs have definitely gone from underneath this screen now. You just done me. <laughs> Go on, mate. <laughs> We're important to say. Well, it's usually common law rights. I think did we cover this on the last video? It's usually common law rights. They, they don't realise that the Act of Parliament sit above common law. You know, yes, they've they got to train them. There's no way around it. You know, they've got to get this done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, that's, that's probably quite timely, as you say, because you've got me there. <laughs> I know I get you. Oh, God, you're right. Okay, serious face. Like. <laughs> hey, listen, do you drink rum? No. What? No. Where'd you come from? Where'd your family come from? My family from Jamaica. And you don't drink rum? No. They must have thrown you out of Jamaica. <laughs> I'm teetotal. Well, you, you're with me next week, aren't you? I am. Yeah, well, it, it's my 43rd Royal Navy anniversary and I'm going to have a rum, aren't we? Uh, I shall partake of soft drink. <laughs> I'll be there with soft drink. There's another Matt, though, as well. Paul Keats, he's coming along. It's his, it's his anniversary as well in a couple, couple of weeks, so he'll be drinking rum. He's a Matt, though. I love doubles and lots of soft drinks. It ain't happening, I'm afraid. I don't drink. I do not drink. No worry, mate. We won't make you go look for the rivet. <laughs> On that note. <laughs> All right, man. I'll speak to you soon. I'll see you tomorrow. Take care. See you tomorrow.